Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for another poetry discussion, a poetry discussion that comes to us uh, from the Wales of World War I, uh, from Isaac Rosenberg. The poem in question is on receiving news of the war. I don't have a physical copy of this, so welcome to the future. I'll be using the interweb on my very own laptop personal computing device. So, this is from movehimintothesun.wordpress, which I've never referenced before. Um, but thank you to the author of this blog for posting on Receiving News of the War by Isaac Rosenberg. The poem reads as such. Snow is a strange white word. No ice or frost has asked of bud or bird for winter's cost. Yet ice and frost and snow from earth to sky this summer land doth know. No man knows why. In all men's hearts it is some spirit old hath turned with malign kiss our lives to mold. Red fangs have torn his face. God's blood is shed. He mourns from his lone place, his children dead. Oh, ancient crimson curse, corrode, consume. Give back this universe, its pristine bloom. So, I want to talk about one stanza in particular here. Uh, for those of you who have spent any any amount of time with me in the six years that I've been doing this, you'll probably know right off the top of your head which stanza that is. It is the penultimate stanza in the poem, which reads as such, Red fangs have torn his face. God's blood is shed. He mourns from his lone place, his children dead. Red fangs have torn his face, the his capitalized, so obviously um, the earliest reference in this poem to God, referenced in the next line uh, with <clears throat> God's blood is shed. So, unsurprisingly, I am going to turn this uh, discussion towards nihilism. And one of the most prominent voices with nihilism, obviously, is Nietzsche. Um, so, Nietzsche had, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, however pretentious you want to be with saying it, um, had definitive thoughts on the ideas of God being dead and what that meant. But here is the extended quote from Nietzsche. I believe it's in The Gay Science. Um, the phrase first appeared in Nietzsche's 1882 collection, The Gay Science. Yeah. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe his blood off of us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of the deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? So the idea here with Nietzsche saying that God is dead is that the role of humankind has become so all-encompassing as to replace the idea of God, but not the purpose of God. Obviously, an atheistic stance, but Nietzsche left open the idea that the purpose for God would create a hole in the human experience, which was regrettable that whole, but, and probably, um, I think that he believed on many levels, irreplaceable. But it had to happen. So, uh, one of the other 
nihilistic ideas that I often talk about on the channel is a quote from Dmitry Pizarev. Uh, Pizarev was another early nihilist, I believe, prior even to Nietzsche. So this was really in the heart of what it meant to be nihilism. And nihilism was, remains, but certainly was an extreme ideology. However, that said, it existed in a time of extreme ideologies. It is rooted in a time of extreme ideologies. ideologies. It is rooted in a, a time of extreme upheaval in the human order, and probably contributing to the fact that nihilism existed at all were the tumultuous times in which it is rooted. Um, and when I say tumultuous times, I mean sort of from even a hundred-ish years before what we're really talking about. Because, so here we have um, Russiapedia.rt.com. Pizarev, born in October of 1840 and died in July of 1868. Um, if I could get quick dates on Nietzsche here from Wikipedia. The, where is Nietzsche's name highlighted? There we go. Nietzsche, of course, born in 40, 1844, died in 1900. Um, so they were closer than I thought. Um, but I believe most of Pizarev's, obviously, you know, dying at 28, most of his work was done earlier in his life than a lot of the stuff that we know, that we uh, still hold on to from Nietzsche. Though Nietzsche was a revolutionary... Uh, look into Nietzsche's childhood. Uh, he was active very early in his life on an, on an extremely intellectual level. But the quote from Pizarev reads as such, Speaking of nihilism, Here is the ultimatum of our camp. What can be smashed must be smashed. Whatever will withstand the blow is sound. What flies into smithereens is rubbish. At any rate, strike out right and strike out left. No harm will or can come of it. That's strong nihilism. This invocation from Rosenberg in this penultimate paragraph, this penultimate stanza here, God's blood is shed sounds an awful lot like God is dead. And I don't just mean to the ears. But <clears throat> what's, the, what's the quote from Iron Man 2? I have made God bleed. There will be blood in the water. The sharks will come. People will cease to believe. <clears throat> God is eternal on the Abrahamic level. Always has been, always will be. Um, and there's nothing that matters all that much in between. This idea of God bleeding is a nihilistic idea. But when we take a step back and we look at the tone of this poem, on receiving news of the war, again, on receiving news of the war, think about the implications of that statement. News has reached me. This thing has started. On receiving news of the war. Now, maybe that is an unfair interpretation. Maybe this um, phrase to Rosenberg meant something closer to on receiving news from the war, the way we're getting uh, here in 2022 updates about the Ukrainian conflict, right? But... When you hear the phrase news of the war, for me, this was sort of on this level, like receiving news of Russia invading Ukraine. You're talking about the very intro deal. So keep that in mind. Receiving news of the beginnings of war. 
and listen to this poem again. Snow is a strange white word. No ice or frost has asked of bud or bird for winter's cost. Yet ice and frost and snow from earth to sky this summer land doth know. No man knows why. In all men's hearts it is. Some spirit old hath turned with malign kiss our lives to mold. Red fangs have torn his face. God's blood is shed. He mourns from his lone place, his children dead. O oh, ancient crimson curse, corrode, consume, give back this universe its pristine bloom. That does not sound very much like that which is blown to smithereens is rubbish, right? So the big split for nihilism prior to like World War I, all nihilism was strong nihilism. Uh, strike out right and strike out left. What is blown to smithereens was garbage anyway. If it stands, if it stands the blow, if we cannot tear it down, it was good. God, according to Nietzsche, did not withstand that blow, meaning God was rubbish. In the face of World War I, what happened was that so many people looked around and said, what will withstand the blow is good, what flies to smithereens was worthless. And here, today, in this battlefield, everything had blown to smithereens. Nothing has withstand the blow, withstood the blow. Therefore, nothing, nothing is any good. So, that second strain of nihilism that said, Nothing's any good. Who cares? Nothing's any good. That is not the seminal strain of nihilism. However, that is the nihilism that has persisted in the world since World War I and World War II. Both of those conflicts happened on such a devastating scale that much in the way religions, like Christianity, were adopted as a defense mechanism against powerlessness, right? So in the old world, nobody had any power except for very, 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 very few people. In the face of that powerlessness, th again, this is another Nietzsche idea, adopting a morality like Christianity says, okay, hey, you can have this world, baby. My prize comes in the next. That type of morality, that type of, of life code, was so prevalent because it was a defense mechanism against the world as it was. It gave people feeling of some type of control in their own life. It was something which was adopted in order to adapt. I adopt this mindset so that I can adapt to the world as it is and feel better on a daily basis. In the wake, uh, so as revolutionary as the ideas of nihilism were in their youth, you could still say, yeah, but you know, it's stupid. You know, it's sort of a weird thing. Okay, I can understand an idea or two from here or there that makes sense. Okay, cool, far out. But I'm still under the, I'm still a stoic. I'm still a uh, rationalist. I'm still a romantic. Whatever the idea was that we're talking about here, you could still be that. But after World War I, when people were killing each other with chemical warfare, 
after World War II and all of the devastation that took place there. You could, it, it was hard to be romantic after that. Hard to be romantic. Hard to be a rationalist, really. When you look at the types of ideas that became prevalent and held power over people in that time. So, in large part, the sort of construct of nihilism, the construct of second strain nihilism, was sort of adopted on a large scale, not to adopt nihilism, but to say, oh, none of it matters, because it can all be blown up by an atom bomb. None of it matters because if you take the wrong breath, that chlorine gas is going to get you. None of it matters because we can rain hell from above. There is no place to hide. What will blow to smithereens is everything. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about the title of that poem a little bit is that it is recognition of the idea of war, meaning such terrible second strain nihilistic ideas. The idea of this war, not the practice. You would be hard pressed, I mean, Rupert Brooke, maybe, but you would be hard pressed besides um, returning We Hear the Larks to find very many poems about World War I that were as prettily phrased as Snow is a strange white word, no ice or frost has asked of bud or bird for winter's cost. Very pretty wording. Very idyllic. Very romantic. But upon receiving word, on receiving word, on receiving news of the war, pardon me, just on receiving news of the war, just on receiving news of the breaking of war, God is dead. It comes clear to this speaker here. That second strain of night, it's all for nothing. Everything is lost. That happens very, very early for our speaker here. You know, red fangs have torn his face. God's blood is shed. He mourns from his lone place, his children dead. God is not dead here. Get that, you know, sort of straight. I'm not saying that uh, Rosenberg is implying that God is dead. But the usefulness of God is dead. He remains in his lone place. But he is damaged. He did not withstand the blow. He is still, he is still but he is in order to mourn his dead children. It's not a very powerful all powerful. That's not a very capable all capable. You know, it's like that idea, uh, could God create a stone so large and heavy that God could not lift it? God couldn't withstand the blow. Of course he could create a stone so big he couldn't lift it. The creating part's the easy part. Lifting it is the work. You know... The trench poets, 
This is my favorite poetry movement. Emily Dickinson's my favorite poet. Charles Bukowski is my possibly my favorite poetic voice. My favorite poet in practice, for sure. Robert Frost is growing on me. But this movement, the trench poets, were really, this was not an argument, these poems were not arguments, they were arguments against. And part of the reason, I think, that they speak to me still, you know, I mean, this is a hundred years later. These poets oftentimes are, are always almost are arguing of the overarch are arguing about the overarching prospects of humankind. They speak across the battle lines. Oh, German mother, did you know that while you're um, sewing these socks, your boy's face down in the mud, never going to wear them, never going to get them. He's dead. While you're maintaining this labor of love, he is dead. And I am not celebrating. As my side struck him down, I am not celebrating that. These poems are activist without being political. They do not assume guilt on the individualistic level. Everyone loses. These poems are... written with a chip on the shoulder, and I know that's a cliche term, the piss and vinegar in these poems, that's what attracts me to them. They are poems of defiance, but not defiance against a thing not defiance against a country, not defiance against a leader, not defiance against a person. They are defiant in the way that literature is universal. No, I don't care about your message. I am a person. No, I don't care about your lines on a map. I am a person. And so are those people you've got me out here shooting. And I think that's why the trench poet movement is, has lived for so long. Everyone can look at these poems and apply them to the struggle that they are having in their lives. So there's a, a commenter that often, uh, a longtime friend of the channel, Starscream Live, who commented on my video about uh, William Blake's A Poison Tree. And I had, you know, an argument for an interpretation of the poem. And he said, hey, I get it. But my problem with this poem is no matter how you're looking at it, it doesn't add up. Nothing adds up here. And I took a step back because that really slapped me in the face. Because I often struggle with Blake, William Blake, as a poet, as a voice, as a writer. And that made a lot of sense that it doesn't add up. And I started thinking sort of in general William Blake reminds me a little bit of Nostradamus, his writings. They are specific enough that you can apply them, but general and generic enough 
that you you can't screw them in. You can get the cast iron on there, but you're not railing it down. If you've got inside you the proper moxie, the proper piss and vinegar, all of these trench poet poems, except for maybe the soldier, you can use them in your life. You can say, returning we hear the larks, now, my job sucks. It's not trench warfare, but it's dehumanizing. And on my drive home from work, when the birds started chirping, perks me up a bit. I understand where this poet's coming from. Not in the Nostradamus way that um, great anger and fury will compel the one who lives on the hill. You know, all of this sort of weird stuff. The trench poets are writing about something. This poem is titled, On Receiving News of the War. But that opening stanza, Snow is a strange white word. No ice or frost has asked of bud or bird for winter's cost. That's not about the, that's not about the war at all, is it? What that's saying there is, um, hey, did you know the bombs are falling? Bombs are falling. The war has started. I have to take a step back and an existential crisis fashion notice something tangible about the world and then make it strange again. And that's something that happens to us a lot, right? People who lose a loved one. The only thing they can think during that phone call is how goddamn uncomfortable their shoes are. Because you dissociate. Our speaker here is simply going through dissociation. Our speaker here is simply saying, oh, that happened? It's too much. Let me focus on something else. But that's something else that I'm focusing on. You receive the call that your loved one has died, and all you can think is how uncomfortable your shoes are. You live in your shoes, don't you? And your shoes are painful, aren't they? And every time you move, you're reminded of how painful your shoes are. That's the same way you're feeling inside, thinking about your loved one being gone. It's painful. And I still live in this life. And every time I move, I'm going to be thinking about that. I'm going to carry that person with me and be thinking about, oh no, that's never the same again. Snow is a strange white word. No ice or frost has asked of bud or bird for winter's cost. War sucks. War is a strange, cold word. And none of the leaders have asked, we're going to put all these people together to shoot each other. What's the cost of that? What's really there at the end of the day? What's the cost? No one's, no one's cared to think that. No one's cared to ask those questions. They're not going to be the ones being shot. They're not going to be the ones inhaling chemicals that ironically make you drowned, drown. One of the things these chemicals would do, tear open holes in your lungs when you inhaled them that then bleed. So you inhaled a gas that made you drown on your own blood. That was one of the, you know, just the perks of World War I. Just the nice, funny things that we used to do to each other. That's all I've got for this poetry discussion on receiving news of the war by Isaac Rosenberg. If you like this sort of thing, it really does help me out here on the channel. If you hit that like button, if you're here by chance but not designed, consider hitting the subscribe button to make sure you were here for poetry discussions in the future, poetry reviews in the future, short story discussions in the future, short story reviews in the future, novel read-alongs in the future, and whatever else it is that I happen to be doing on this channel, writer's quotes, opening paragraph discussions, all that sort of stuff I do here on the channel. So if 
you like that sort of thing. If you're interested in something like that, or you might be, um, make sure you stick around in order to be here for more of it. And I hope to see you next time.